Good morning and welcome to worship as we gather together here for the second Sunday uh, after Trinity. We are going to be once again using the service of Matins and uh, well, let's begin. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouths will declare your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O oh Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ. Alleluia. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Oh, come, let us worship him. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in His hand. The strength of the hills is His also. The sea is His for He made it and His hand formed on the dry. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship Him. Our psalm for today is Psalm 34, verses 12 to 22. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, 
and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our office hymn for this morning is hymn number 510. A multitude comes from the east and the west. Testament reading for today is from Proverbs chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading for the second Sunday of Trinity is from Ephesians chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, 
and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading for today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. When one of those who reclined at table with Jesus heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We continue with the responsory. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, first things first. This is a saying that I have heard all my life. It's all about setting one's priorities to ensure that the important things are done before the unimportant. Now, the people in the story Jesus tells have lost their sense of priority. Now, to be honest, this parable is not properly understood without the context of the entire chapter of Luke in which it appears. You see, Jesus is facing a test at the home of the Pharisee to which he has been invited to eat. They bring a man in to see if Jesus will heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus asks them for their judgment in the situation, and they refuse to speak. So, he heals the man. Then Jesus explains his action by asking them about which one of them would allow an ox or a son to fall into a well on the Sabbath and not rescue it or him. 
Clearly, it's an issue of priorities. Sabbath law or ox or son. Just as clearly, Jesus expects them to choose the ox or the son, but to say so might be seen as blasphemy. So they once again keep silent. Then Jesus moves on and talks about humility. He suggests that they not seek the place of honor when invited to a dinner, but take the lowest seat and allow themselves to be honored by being moved up rather than being shamed by being made to give the place of honor to someone else and thus be humiliated. Of course, there are risks with humility. Your host might not see anything amiss in your taking the place of least significance. And then you will find out where you really belong in his estimation. The question is, which is more important? The place of honor with the risk of embarrassment or the opportunity for recognition and honor with the risk of finding out that you did not merit any, but without the humiliation before others? Again, it is a question of setting priorities. Then Jesus tells the man who had invited him that when he gives a luncheon, he should not invite family and friends, people he would like to impress, who might also return the kindness of his invitation, but rather invite those who would have need of the invitation and no means to repay his kindness, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Jesus says that such kindness would be repaid by God at the resurrection. And this presents another setting of priorities. Good times and goodwill here and now, or later with the Lord. At this point in the narrative, someone spouts off with the seemingly out of place comment, blessed is everyone who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So why say that now in this place in the story? And why, in seeming response to the outburst, does Jesus tell the parable of the banquet spurned? I was sitting in my office wondering about this, thinking about this, and then it struck me. It's just like when I preach about how rich we are and how God gives us our riches for his purposes, and I get the sort of responses from people that say, there's nothing wrong with my going on vacation or owning nice things or visiting my children in another province. When you preach about how we use our time or our things, Pastor, you make me feel guilty. But I have every right to do with my life and my possessions what I please. You can't tell me that I have to do this or that to go to heaven. And of course, I cannot. And I really do not want to. Jesus was talking about priorities and was confronting how everyone tends to deal with life and with one another and with God. He was explaining how God looked at things, the divine values and priorities. The guy who shouted out the, blessed is everyone who uh, shall eat bread in the kingdom of God, was trying to excuse their priorities and dismiss what Jesus was saying by saying, we're all gonna eat bread in the kingdom and no one is gonna be unhappy there, so what difference does it make if we do this or that, how we manage the little stuff or how we treat the poor? It was a just get off our back kind of thing. Being Jews, you know, the chosen people, they knew that they were going to go to heaven. And thus they really wanted to pay more attention to life on earth right now and worry about heaven once they got there. Jesus' response said, in effect, that that might be true for those who are going to heaven. But how do you know that you're going to make it? Jesus took the presupposition which lay behind the man's statement and told him the truth, showed him the truth about it and what it meant. Israel, as individuals, not as the entire nation, lived more or less just as the man had asserted. They lived like so many of us 21st century Christians live today, taking God and eternity for granted and making the most of the day we live in. But according to the purposes of the flesh, not according to the purposes of God. The moment came, and it's never at convenient times that it comes. And the call went out. The dinner was ready. Everything is prepared. Come to the feast. But those invited, the chosen people, found themselves too wrapped up in the affairs of life to heed the invitation. Now, was the dinner less important than their excuses? I don't think so. It was simply a matter of priorities. 
Israel had gotten so wrapped up in living the blessings of God that they lost sight of both the giver and of the purpose of the gifts. They didn't say that they didn't want God or they didn't want eternal life. They just wanted them on their terms and they wanted them when they were ready. They forgot that love and hate in the sight of God is not the same as it is in our hearts and our thoughts. With God, it is a matter of setting priorities and anything preferred to or more urgent than God means that you love that thing and despise God. Because they found everything more urgent and real than God and faith and salvation, they were found to be unworthy. And God went out and dragged the unworthy in and gave them the banquet. And thank God for that. Because you know those people who were brought in later. You and I are those blind, crippled, lame, and worthless people who just happen to have stumbled into the riches of life and salvation. We didn't find it on our own. We didn't choose it on our own. But we were found in the hedges and on the back alleys of life and compelled to come in. That, brothers and sisters, is the grace of God. Jesus prepared the feast of salvation by his death on the cross for our sins and dragged us into the dinner hall without asking our consent. See, the banquet rests on the table before you this day. Here is life and salvation, forgiveness and peace and resurrection and joy. And of course, now that we have become the chosen ones, we also run the risk of taking it for granted and finding other things more exciting and more urgent and more pleasurable and skipping the meal anyhow. But this parable does not tell you to beware. It tells you of the wonderful grace of God in bringing you into this banquet of life and forgiveness and peace and salvation so that you may rejoice and give thanks. It's about setting priorities. The argument about priorities is not with me or with Jesus. It's an argument with your flesh. God will not be put in second place. And salvation will not wait for you to exercise your perfect rights as a Canadian to have and to do and to go and to enjoy. If there are more urgent things in your life, well, then there are more urgent things in your life. We ask nothing that you cannot freely give or do. After all, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. But remember, while everyone in heaven is going to be delighted to be there, not everyone who thinks they are going will end up in heaven. Those who take it so much for granted that they can count other things more precious or more urgent run the risk of finding that the call to the banquet that they were waiting for came while they were busy with something else, while they were too busy to come to the banquet. So look at what you've got. Count the blessedness of being dragged in, unworthy though we are, to the banquet of salvation. Give thanks and keep your wits about you. You were chosen for something that you don't deserve, but you really want and you desperately need. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the canticle for today, the Te Deum.
the noble army of martyrs praise you. The Holy Church throughout all the world does acknowledge you. The Father of an infinite majesty, your adorable true and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, you are the King of glory, O Christ. You are the everlasting Son of the Father. When you look upon yourself to deliver man, you humbled yourself to be born of a virgin. When you had overcome the sharpness of death, you opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You sit at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that you will come to be our judge. We therefore pray you to help your servants whom you have redeemed with your precious blood. Make them to be numbered with your saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save your people and bless your heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify you, and we worship your name forever and ever. Grant, O oh Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O oh Lord, let your mercy be upon us as our trust is in O oh Lord, in you I have trusted, never let me be confounded. We continue with prayer, beginning with the Kyrie. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come to you. O oh Lord, since you never fail to help and govern those whom you nurture in your steadfast fear and love, work in us a perpetual fear and love of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and and forever. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we, your untrustworthy... Here. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble and hearty thanks for all the goodness and loving kindness that you bestow on us. We praise you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, we bless you for your boundless love and the redemption of the world by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. We implore you to give us a right understanding of all your mercies, that our hearts may be ever deeply thankful 
and that we may show forth your praise with both our lips and our lives. Direct our lives in ways of holiness and righteousness all our days, that we may enjoy the testimony of a good conscience and the hope of your favor. Be sustained and comforted in every time of trouble, and finally be received into your everlasting kingdom. Through Christ Jesus, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We close out this morning's service with hymn number 690, Hope of the World, 690.
Thank you so much for coming and taking part in today's worship service. And I pray that we'll see you again for next Sunday, which is the third Sunday after Trinity. Until then, God bless you in your week. Amen.